Sunday evening worship. If you're visiting with us, we're happy you came our way. We want to invite you back to every opportunity you have. On our prayer list, if you would uh, like to see the extended prayer list, well, it's posted on the overhead and uh, also on the book. And uh, other prayers we ask. Next shelter is home and can't have business, and please call first before you go. And Robert Nelson will be in Dallas, University of Texas Southwest, Southwest. She'll be there Monday and Tuesday for test. Let's remember uh, the family of Charles Tuck. He passed away last week, and the searches were here at the building yesterday. And Janice Richardson's brother-in-law, Bobby Warsh. Passed away last week and was buried at Greenwood Cemetery Saturday. And then in our news, uh, leadership training for crisis. Well, we've already had that. Okay. That was today at 3:30. The latest class is concluded for the year, and so no class will be this week. <coughs> the Mount Vernon Church of Christ will have a <coughs> breakfast November the 23rd at 8 p.m. And I understand that. Band will be leaving here at 7. That will be uh, this coming Saturday. I believe that's right in this coming Saturday. That's all I have. Unless someone has more announcements, we'll continue our same course. Number 682682. Pure Get It. Pure. It's convenient. Let's stand the same. Number 682.
Encourage us to live a life that's uh, deserving of you, Father, that's pleasing to you, Father. Pray that you'll be with those that are not here for um, illness, Father. Just, we pray that it's your will that you might give them a measure of health, that they might be back with us soon. And we just pray as always that guys can direct us through our lives and through the same. In Christ's name, amen. Judge, we kind of think of it in 
one way today, but in that particular time, a judge was more like a leader. A person who went out and who led the armies of Israel against God's enemies. And that's who Samson was. He was a leader. He was kind of an unconventional leader, though. And a lot of the reason was because of his own desires that he fought with uh, in his life. Well, these judges would lead and Israel, they would fight the captors, and they would bring Israel back to freedom. Well, Samson was to be a Nazarite from birth. What is a Nazarite? It was a person who took a vow to be dedicated to the Lord for a period of time. According to Numbers chapter 6 and verses 2 to 21, Nazarites were to avoid any form of wine. They were to refrain from cutting their hair, and they were also to avoid contact with the dead. And so the Nazarites had a special vow. And Samson was a special child because he was going to be a Nazarite from the time of his birth till the time of his death. And God chose him to be this way. And he had a special purpose. He was to deliver God's people from the Philistines. Well, God gave Samson a, an additional gift. And it was the gift of physical strength, extraordinary physical strength. And he was able to do some really amazing things with this strength that God gave him. So let's think about some lessons from the life of Samson this evening. Turn over a few pages to Judges 14 and verses 1 through 3. We'll talk about the first lesson that we learned from the life of Samson. And that lesson is this. It is important to marry wisely and not let our physical desires control our decisions. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14 of the book of Judges. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, give her for me as a wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised of Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me. For she pleases me well. Well, what an interesting conversation there. You know, normally in those day and age, those that day and time, I guess you should say, um, it was up to the parents to choose who the child would marry. But uh, Samson is here choosing for himself, and it's not the conventional way to do things. And he wanted to take a wife from the enemies of God's people instead of from among God's people themselves. And his parents did not approve of this. The law of Moses specifically uh, forbade Israelites to marry Philistines. According to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 3. And so Samson was not doing what is right here. He let his Carnal desires carrying him away for women. He did that more than once. But of course, God is able to use our evil choices for good. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. says, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord, them who are called according to His purposes. And so God is then able to turn this around and use this uh, to defeat the Philistines, which he was seeking to do. Ultimately, in this story, we see that Samson's wife and father-in-law were subsequently murdered by the Philistines because of Samson's uh, carnal desires that he had. Well, the lesson that we want to draw from this is that we need to be circumspect or think wisely and carefully about who we are going to marry. Before marrying, we should certainly reflect upon what God's desires are and what is pleasing to the Lord, as opposed to 
of what pleases us and what our desires are. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. It is always wise to consult God about these matters. Samson was not wise here. He, instead of seeking the Lord's will, instead of doing what his parents knew needed to be done, he sought his own will and he neglected his parents' desires. Samson allowed that which pleased him to make that choice for him. Judges chapter 17 and verse, or Judges chapter 14 and verse 7 says, Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. So it was all about what Samson wanted and not about what God wanted. We need to be careful about that. Marriage is a lifelong decision. The Bible teaches that we're supposed to get married once and we're supposed to stay married throughout our entire life. And, and we're not supposed to uh, not be married until death do us part. That's the ideal situation. That's the ideal circumstance. That's what God wants. Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, Jesus said this, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Malachi chapter 3, it says that God hates divorce. He hates it. So he does not want marriage to end in divorce. A lot of times people get married out of carnal desires. It seems like the city of Las Vegas exists for that single purpose alone. Carnal desires. And so it is a method for people. We want to get married one day and get divorced the next. You can do all that within 24 hours later. The Bible says that we ought not to be carried away by such desires. In Colossians 3, verses 5 through 10, we read, uh, Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And here's what he's talking about putting to death. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence or desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, in which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. But now you are also to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. We're supposed to live after the image of Jesus Christ. And that means we need to be renewed in knowledge. The world has a knowledge. And God has a knowledge. The world's knowledge is a carnal knowledge. God's knowledge is a spiritual knowledge. We have been taught by the world to have worldly, carnal knowledge. God says, be renewed in knowledge. In other words, make that knowledge that God wanted us to have in the beginning when He created Adam and Eve perfect, pure, and sinless. Make that knowledge that He gave to Jesus Christ who was sinless on this earth. Make that knowledge your knowledge. Renew your knowledge. And so we learn from the life of Samson that it's important to marry wisely and not let our physical desires control our decisions. Second, we learn from the life of Samson that pride goes before destruction. Let's read second, or I'm sorry, let's read uh, Judges chapter 16 and verse 4 and following. Judges 16, verse 4 and following. The story of Samson and Delilah. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him. Find out where his 
great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dry, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dry, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room, and she said to them, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of this strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now, please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be found with. Then he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. So she wove it tightly with the, bat, uh, the batter of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled off the batter and the web from the loom. <coughs> then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? Oof. She's hitting below the belt there, huh? <laughs> you have bought me these three times, and have not told me where your great, great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words, and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. Then he told her all his heart, and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called to the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in her hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Samson ended up being proud of himself, and in the end, it destroyed him. So what, what about this story are we to take away from this? Well, he suggested all these ways to take away his strength, and yet none of them worked until he finally told her, you'll cut my hair. And there was a reason that he lost his strength because he was a Nazarite. He was not supposed to shave his head. And so he did the thing the Lord forbade him to do and his strength left him. But Samson assumed that that would not happen. He was so proud of himself. He thought he was going to continue to be strong regardless of what happened. Well, no one is so high and mighty that they are above God. The Bible says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. If we want to destroy our lives, then we have a sure recipe for doing that. Simply let us lift up our eyes with pride and do what we want to do and all that we desire and we will destroy our lives. Well, Samson did all of his desire, everything he wanted to do up until that point. Finally, he took too far. And that's what destroyed his life. In Obadiah 1 and 3 and 4, Obadiah writes this prophecy to, I believe it's the nation of Edom. He says, The pride of 
thine heart hath deceived thee, that thou dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, I will bring him down, says the Lord. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord because if we don't, we will find ourselves being brought very low, just like Samson was. James wrote, Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and He shall lift you up. James chapter 4, verse 10. The final lesson we learn from the life of Samson is a really great lesson. And it's the lesson that while we yet live, it is never too late to turn to God. Let's look at Samson's last days, starting here in verse 21. and read, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. The people saw him. They praised their God. They said, Our God has delivered in our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from prison. And he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me fill the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women, on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two little, little pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it, so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought, brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of his father, Manoah. He had judged Israel twenty years. Samson did not have a good end. In some ways, the Philistines put out his eyes, and so he was blind. They put him to work in a mill, like you put a, a donkey to work, turning the mill, and grinding uh, uh, grain and other things like that. They gave credit for his capture to Dagon, their false god, and they made a celebration to honor this false God. And that's what they were doing in that temple when Samson ended it all. During this procession, they called Samson and put him before everyone to mock him, to have him perform for them, the Bible says. Samson being completely humiliated, one last time, he called upon the Lord and asked the Lord to give him back his strength. And the Lord did. He answered his prayer. In this last moment of his life, he answered his prayer. He gave him back his strength. 
He pushed those two pillars apart, and that, of course, ended the celebration and in Samson's life as well. And it was said that Samson slew more in his death than in his life. Judges 16 and verse 30. Samson's life was not exemplary. He married outside the law of Moses. He fraternized with, with harlots and prostitutes. He lied to many people for many for his own purposes. And he allowed others to manipulate him and to violate God's will. Exactly a, an ideal story of a judge, you might think. But God used Samson for his purposes. And in the end, Samson gave himself wholly to the Lord. We sang that song a few minutes ago, I surrender all. You know, that's what Samson did at the end. He surrendered all to God. You know, we find ourselves in similar situations from time to time when we allow our sin to overcome us and to control us, to allow people of the world to use us and manipulate us, to go against God's will. We're just as responsible as Samson was. And yet, God is merciful and gracious and forgiving. And He loves us. And He loves Samson. And even though Samson did a lot of wicked things in his life, the Bible does not spare him from calling out all the wickedness that he did. Yet at the end, he gave himself wholly to the Lord, and God granted him blessing. Samson's name goes down in the Heroes Hall of Faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, he's listed. And if he can be listed there, any one of us can be. God is merciful and forgiving. Listen to Psalm 37, verses 23 to 26. The steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. That's describing God, our God, the God of Simpson, the God that we serve today. Jesus tells us, you be merciful like your Father in heaven is merciful. Luke 6 and verse 36. <coughs> Hebrews 8 and verse 12 says, God will be merciful to the, unrighteous, to the unrighteous and their sins and their iniquities he will remember no more. Samson is an interesting story. Full of a lot of questions I have. But yet, there's some great lessons that we can learn from this story. Number one, let's resolve not to be like Samson. Let our desires, our passions control our life. But rather, let's think carefully about our lives. And especially those who are young and who are not yet married and thinking about marrying. Let's have the Lord have His way when it comes to those kinds of decisions. Let's remember that pride goes before destruction. And no matter how big we may get, we are not too big to take a big fall. If that happened to Samson, it can happen to any one of us if we allow our pride to exceed our, uh, the Lord in this life. And then let's remember that while we yet live, it is not too late to turn to God. A person may live his entire life in rebellion to God, and at the end of his life, repent and come back to God, and the Lord will receive him back. 
that is a tremendous, great lesson that should fill us full of hope for all of those we know that are around us in the world today. There's always a way back to the Lord. Maybe tonight you need to come back to the Lord. You need to uh, repent this evening like Samson did. Call upon the Lord so that you can turn your life around and live for Him once again. If that's what you need to do, then we're ready to help you this evening. Maybe you need to become a child of God. Well, we haven't studied about Jesus Christ this evening and His plan of salvation. Nevertheless, all of the things that we've talked about in this story are applicable because Jesus wants the same things that God wanted out of Samson when Samson was alive. Obedience, love, service, sacrifice. And this evening you can give your life to the Lord by hearing His Word and believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus is the Son of God and being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to do that tonight, we're ready to help you. So whatever you may be this evening, you can come now and make it known. All together we stand. All this
And we hope that we have a home in heaven with you on that day of judgment. In Christ's name, amen.